They say that the lights never go out in Las Vegas. For some, the perpetual twilight cast by the million neon stars sets the scene for endless possibilities, many of which will never be mentioned out loud. For some small few, though, those who have known true darkness, the lights of Vegas are a sanctuary, a place purpose-built, it would seem, to keep the shadows back, or, perhaps more accurately, keep what's in the shadows back. Today's tale is collected from a young dealer hiding in the light and running from his nightmares in the city of dreams. Let me tell you a story. The Grave Walker. Joe Mathis was crazy. The whole town knew it. Not the dangerous kind of crazy. He just wasn't right. For one thing, he always had something stuffed in his ears. Pieces of paper, cotton, wadded up napkins, whatever he could find, really. Because of this, or at least as far as anyone could tell, he had the tendency to yell everything. His gravelly shouts could be heard over the din at the local diner as he gave his order for eggs over easy and jam, or at the grocery store when asking when the next shipment of sardines would be in. The ones with the old man on the tin. His most frequent haunt, however, was at the local electronics store, buying lights. This is where he was today, shouting questions about battery life into Jeremy's face. Jeremy was used to it by now. It had become almost a daily ritual of the past couple of months since he got the job. Every day, at four o'clock sharp, the tiny bell on the door would herald Crazy Joe's arrival. Then, for the next hour or so, Joe would ask about the inventory of light bulbs, talk at length about how many lumens a particular flashlight might have, or get into deep dissertations about the need for backup power. Backups for your backups, you see, so when one goes down, the other one's ready. Jeremy, being the newest employee, was put on Joe duty. Todd, his best friend, thought it was hilarious. He was the son of the owner and had spent many years working the shop dealing with Crazy Joe. A responsibility he was all too happy to offload onto his friend. Not that Jeremy minded. He would use those breaks from stocking shelves to daydream, as Joe pointed and gesticulated at various pieces of inventory that caught his eye. Although, his daydreams had developed a bitter flavor the longer he stayed there. Not the electronics store, necessarily. Just there. His small town, living his small life. At first, he thought it would be fun. Work with his best friend all day, hang out with his crew all night, maybe even work up the courage to finally talk to Becky Little from high school. The only problem was, the rest of the crew had gone off to college or to work in the city. Even Becky had eventually gone off into the world somewhere. And here he was, in the same spot he had always been, too afraid to take a step forward, stuck, listening to Joe go on and on about how enough batteries would keep the dock back all night if you plan it just right. Jeremy suddenly had a terrible vision of being this man, stuck in this place, slowly losing his mind. Distracted by his own thoughts, Jeremy had noticed that Todd had walked up behind Crazy Joe, or CJ as he liked to call him, and had begun lip-syncing along with the animated man's well-worn talking points. He even had his characteristic slow head nod down pat, bobbing along to the rhythm of his verbal onslaught. Jeremy had to pretend to cough to fight back a chuckle after a particularly well-synced hand movement from the two almost made him lose it. His mirth, though, turned to concern as Todd winced, his hand shooting to his temple and turning away. His headaches had been getting worse lately, sharp little jolts of pain he called brain jabs. They had started shortly after graduation, Jeremy suspected it was from years of booze-filled late nights followed by early alarm clocks for work. But Todd would always just wave it away and insist he was just dehydrated or something. Fifteen minutes later, the bell on the door rang again, marking Joe's departure. As he left, he shouted something back about it getting dark earlier and needing to get his things ready before the door slid shut and finally muffled his voice. He was right. The days were getting shorter as they got deeper into the fall, and at five, the sun was already kissing the horizon, turning the sky a light pink. In the years that follow, 
Jeremy will look back on that sunset and remember it as being the last one that didn't fill him with dread. Another brain jab, huh? Jeremy asked. More like a brain beating today, Todd winced. I guess those shots last night were a mistake. Maybe we just close up early today, huh? Jeremy knew there'd be hell to pay if Todd's dad found out they closed early. But he doubted anyone would visit within the next hour anyway, so who would know, really? With that thought, he switched off the neon open sign and began helping Todd shut down the rest of the shop. Within ten minutes, Todd was swearing at the lock as he jiggled and pulled his keys, muttering how he was in no mood for your shit tonight. The beam of the flashlight bobbed in time with Jeremy's chuckles as he laughed at his friend's idle threats. Once the key had finally released, the two made the decision to cut through the woods, as it would be faster and Todd was eager to get home. Alright, just remember if my dad asks, I left you to close up tonight, Todd reminded for the third time. Yeah, I know. Jeremy sighed, idly kicking rocks as they walked down the dirt path. You alright? Todd asked. Jeremy took a moment with the question. He watched the light from his flashlight wander over the nearby terrain and trace the beginnings of the overgrown iron fence that marked the old town cemetery. Yeah, man, I'm just... I don't know. Restless, I guess? I just feel like I'm wasting time, you know? Todd sighed, having heard all of this before. Like I said, why the rush? We're young and finally free to have some fun before life gets, you know, too heavy. You need to learn how to relax, man. Nah, I know, it's just that... What is that? Todd cut him off, his hand pressing into Jeremy's shoulder to stop his movement. The crunching of the boy's footsteps halted, and in the silence, Jeremy could just hear a faint, discordant crooning coming from beyond the cemetery fence. For a moment, both Jeremy and Todd stood and just listened to the strange little noise echoing out of the darkness. Then, Todd took a sudden step forward, his arm falling from Jeremy's shoulder. It's so... Todd took another step forward, his voice barely a whisper. Beautiful. His hand reached out towards the crooked iron gate that hung slightly ajar, rusted with age. It didn't sound beautiful to Jeremy. He couldn't quite place it, but it unsettled something deep within him. It stirred the memory of a classmate's funeral back in elementary school. The boy had been hit by a car. Jeremy thought he could hear the quiet, broken noises of that boy's mother in the sound ahead. The sound someone makes when all joy has been stripped away, leaving only sorrow. He found himself frozen as he listened to that crooning. Frozen as he watched Todd walk into the darkness. There was something else in that song. Something predatory. The soft footfall of a hunter just before the strike. Wait, what are you doing? Jeremy hissed, finding his voice weak. Todd looked back, smiling through the darkness. We gotta go see where it's coming from! He called back, his voice sounding strange in that moment, almost discordant like the song. Then, giddy with an excitement Jeremy hadn't seen from him since they were children, Todd bounded out of the light and into the shadow of the graveyard. Jeremy was left alone in the darkness, only his flashlight for company. His heart was beating hard in his chest, though his feet stay frozen to the ground. He wanted more than anything to run, to find help to be anywhere but here. But at the same time, he couldn't leave Todd behind. And something in him knew time was running out. So, with a white knuckle grip on the flashlight, Jeremy did the hardest thing he had ever done. He took a step forward, then another. His careful steps gave way to a jog as he passed the intricate iron gate and began frantically scanning his flashlight over the old crumbling headstones, searching for Todd. All the while, the crooning sound grew louder and louder. Jeremy could swear that it almost seemed to be coming from inside of his head, as though echoing through his mind. Finally, where the hill crested and earth gave way to sky, he saw him. Todd was walking forward slowly. His hand reached out almost reverently to touch something. Jeremy swung the beam of light to where he was looking, but there was nothing there. Only the ever-present song now seeming all around them. Then, his light began to flicker. Quick periods of darkness at first gave way to longer moments of night. Jeremy tried to yell for Todd to come back, reached for the words to convince him to run. All attempts caught in his throat, though, as glimpses into the darkness revealed something hidden by the light. First, 
a pale glowing orb floating in the dark. Flicker. Then, the darkness surrounding the orb coalesced into something more solid. Flicker. The gentle curve of a horn. Finally, the light died completely, and the full form of the creature revealed itself. A hulking beast on four skeletal legs with a wispy mane of fur that swayed in some unfelt breeze as it lumbered forward. The pale glow of the moonlight highlighted peaks and valleys of ribs through a fetid black pelt, and a mist puffed from its jaws as it crooned its terrible song in the chill night air. But worst of all were those eyes. A glow with an ethereal light and completely focused on Todd as though nothing else in the world existed. And he, in turn, seemed captivated by them as he reached out to touch the nightmare. Finding the voice to cry out, Jeremy rushed forward to try to intercept his friend. But a cemetery is a treacherous place in the darkness, and the jagged edge of a broken grave marker rose up to bar his path, sending him sprawling into the mounded earth. He was able to look up just in time to see the very tips of Todd's fingers brush the creature's snout. As he did, a light breeze sighed through the surrounding trees as the creature's song died away, and with it, his friend, dropping lifelessly among the headstones. Jeremy howled into the night, scrambling to his feet and stumbling over stones and cops of overgrown grass, trying to reach Todd, to pull him away, to do something. Halfway there, though, he stopped as a song filled the graveyard once more. But this time, it was glorious. Listening to it, Jeremy couldn't remember why he was so upset. The sound filled him, flooded him with warmth and excitement. And looking up, he could see the majestic creature's luminous eyes were focused on him, just him. They made him feel important, brave, like he finally had the courage to take that step forward and take his future into his own hands. Those eyes, that song, they beckoned him closer. They called for him to reach out and touch. And he did reach out, stepping over the body of his friend, anything to stand before his goal, to touch, to join. No boy! A shout echoed from down the hill as a glaring beam of light cut through the night, dissipating the creature. Jeremy, confused by the sudden disappearance, still reached out to where the song was emanating from. But his touch found nothing. Then it all rushed back to him. The monster. That corpse-like frame in the moonlight. Todd's body at his feet. Suddenly the song was ugly and terrible to him again. Run, damn it! The voice yelled up to him. Determined not to abandon him, Jeremy reached down and tried to lift up Todd's lifeless body, desperately pulling to move away towards the safety of the light. But then that light also began to flicker and dull. As it did, he could see what was watching him from the darkness, calling its terrible song as it crept ever closer with every break of light. Jeremy heaved his friend along the path in a mad panic. Then. The load lifted as another hand grabbed onto Todd and began pulling. In the flickering glow of the flashlight, Crazy Joe gritted his teeth and strained under Todd's weight. Jeremy turned back into the momentary darkness, only to realize he was face to face with the creature's glowing eyes once again, the smell of rotten death wafting over him as it bellowed out its song. In the dimming light that followed, he could see that Joe had slid his thumb down to a secondary switch on the flashlight to where a tangle of batteries and hardware had been crudely wired into place. Click. Suddenly, light, even brighter than before, burst from the dying flashlight. The creature vanished into mist mere inches from Jeremy's face. Together, Jeremy and Joe hauled Todd's body into Joe's waiting truck, the whole way pursued by the sad, hungry song of the Gravewalker. With lights blaring, they sped back to town, back to streetlights, back to safety. The days that followed were a blur of questions, sadness, and the funeral service for his friend. The sound of Todd's father's sobs overwhelmed Jeremy, flooding his head with visions of glowing eyes and the horror of that night. The coroner said the cause of death was an aneurysm. He said that the headaches Todd was experiencing 
were symptoms of an underlying condition. Of course, Jeremy had told everyone what happened. He told them about the monster and how Todd had touched it, and how that was what had killed him. This was just met with a shake of a head and whispered conversations of, The poor boy was there when it happened, and he must just be having trouble dealing with it. All Joe had to say on the matter was that all Jeremy could do was be ready. He gave him a small shoebox full of assorted batteries and earplugs, nodding knowingly as he told him to stay out of the dark. Three weeks later, Jeremy boarded a plane. Determined not to become another crazy Joe, he decided to leave his small town and go live with his uncle in Nevada. After all, they say the lights never go out in Las Vegas.